Hello, I'm Tina Shaddix Rydenberry and I've been asked to share some thoughts and ideas and some of my experience on discovery, trying to get the things you need in a divorce case. Um, and I'm going to talk both about informal discovery, which is becoming more and more apparent, uh, excuse me, more and more um, important, I believe, and formal discovery. So informal discovery, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the iPhones, the computers, the Facebook pages. Let me, let me just give you um, some important information regarding accessing those um, items and also um, websites. Um, when you're doing discovery concerning something that's on a computer or iPhone or on a website, one thing you want to think about is serving a spoilation letter and um, putting the other side on notice that they shouldn't destroy or delete any information. So I'm happy to share some examples of spoilation letters if you would like to email me and we can send you some that we've prepared and used in other cases. Um, basically we want them to preserve evidence and let them know the repercussions under Georgia law if they were to destroy any evidence. Another um, thing to think about in informal discovery is the iPhones or the Androids. Um, these little mini computers that have every secret that a person could ever have in their life contained right there, a mobile device they can lose and leave somewhere. There are a number of interesting issues concerning phones. Um, and I'm going to share one of my clients' situation. Um, his wife was having an affair with her boss, a church friend of theirs, and she had a work phone and a personal phone. The personal phone was an iPhone. and. Um, he found out one evening about the affair. He asked her to speak with him about something important. He didn't tell her what it was. And he said, I need your full attention. Please hand me your phone so we can not be distracted. She did so. And he confronted her about the affair. As soon as he started letting her know that he was aware of it, she lunged toward him for the phones. He ran into a bathroom, locked the door. Um, she, when she came in, there was a scuffle, and thank goodness she had one of those life-proof cases on her phones. Um, she, he gave her back her work phone, but the phone that she had been using that was the personal phone that was a gift from him previously for Christmas. It was on his account. He refused to give it to her. Um, he had not retained me or even spoken to me at this time. He called me the next week, and we made an appointment. He did something very smart before he got any legal advice, and he called the um, cell phone provider and had the all um, service turned off to that phone. Uh, excuse me, all service turned off on that phone at 2 a.m. the morning um, that he grabbed the phone from her. And that turns out to have been a very important act on his behalf because he had taken that step. No one could remotely clean all the data that was on that phone. When he came in to see me, um, we talked about filing for a complaint for divorce, and we also talked about me filing a motion with the court requiring, um, letting the court know that we believe this phone had a lot of important information and that we wanted a court order to have a computer forensic um, specialist retrieve all the data and get all the information off the phone. Um, and that's what we did. We filed a complaint, and we filed a motion um, asking to ju do just that be able to get all the data, photos, text messages, emails, photos, like I said already, um, uh, website searches off the phone. And the computer company that we contacted um, took, came and picked it up and stored it in what they call a no signal enclosure box. And apparently a no signal enclosure box is very important when you are proceeding along this route. Excuse me because these phones can be wiped clean remotely. But because my client had stopped um, any service and because we got it in the no signal enclosure box pretty quickly, the, the evidence on the phone was preserved. Um, because my client had taken the steps he did and because we were able to preserve that evidence and bring the matter before the court, we were able to successfully get a very good settlement for him in very short order. Um, Many times I've spoken about gaining information off of computers and phones, and oftentimes I've discussed preserving the hard drive, the computer, the laptop, and phone, and going to the court and asking for access to it. And then you alleviate a number of problems, consider, excuse me, considering um, computer privacy laws, trespassing on, um, you know, 
information that you don't have a right to. So I think that's always the best course of action. Um, instead of, well, you should never advise your client to access telephones or computers that are not clearly um, belong to the family or belong to that person, that uh, are password protected, um, that the other person has an expectation of privacy because you will run a violation of state and federal civil and criminal laws. Um, I think that we run the risk as family of we run the risk as family law lawyers with not um, getting on the computer as soon as we get involved in the case and start googling um, the opposing party, the alleged paramour, our client, um, going on the internet and finding things um, on Facebook, LinkedIn, Google, obviously Twitter. Twitter, you would be amazed at the tweets that you may find in a case that could end up helping you. Instagram, and when you're doing this, you don't want to just Google or search the person's name. You also need to search any email addresses or um, I don't know what they call the little abbreviated names, like on Twitter, if, if your client is familiar with, like if I'm Tina Rod on Instagram, search Tina Rod on Twitter and other, um, other sites, and you'll be amazed at the information you might be able to get. And I think because of so much information that we do run into um, on those sites, um, that we really, in order to do our due diligence in any case, really should spend some time or have a paralegal spend some time or someone in the office trying to find what we can on those sites in any case. Um, you also should also Google the cell phone number of, of these same people because sometimes some of the more obscure websites such as looking for casual sex in the Atlanta area um, only identify people by cell phone numbers or other quote handles or abbreviated names. Um, another um, situation you may run into that uh, your client may have access to a lot of information their spouse um, has on their Apple products. A lot of clients um, set up at one Apple ID for the whole family. Um, they share the same iTunes account they can, through that same Apple ID, have access to all text messages and emails going to all the devices that are under that one Apple ID account. So that's another conversation you should have um, for a variety of reasons, one of which is to protect your client in the event that they were not aware their spouse was getting every text or email that um, they received on their device. Another um, place to go for some important financial information without serving discovery include financial planners or advisors, um, those consultants that come along and suggest they'd like to help them plan for their retirement or plan for paying for college. Um, often your client has met with such a person and you can get a lot of very important financial information in a very short period of time depending on any analysis that that financial planner may have um, done for the couple. Um, of course, mortgage loan applications have always been um, important documents for us to get our hands on, which your client should have access to if it was a jointly applied for loan. Um, going on GSCCA, um, Georgia State, I don't, I don't know exactly what the acronym is for, but it, it's a service that um, you can obtain all the real estate records in the state of Georgia online. We should all be checking um, our spouses. Um, of our clients for any additional real estate um, that may exist and our real estate that a mistress or boyfriend may own that could possibly hold some marital funds. Along those lines, going um, to the courthouses and obtaining the divorce agreements of the boyfriends and girlfriends of our client's spouse. Um, it can be very telling how one matter is handled in their divorce um, and might give your clients some um, information that is important when they're negotiating their own divorce settlement. Of course, your client can on his own or her own go to all the financial institutions and get the information from the banks uh, if there are any joint accounts. Um, they may also have run credit reports on each other or be part of a credit reporting um, a service where they have had access to credit reports run on their spouse 
we always have our clients run a credit report when we are retained um, to make sure there aren't any unusual credit cards out there that they both can charge on that they've forgotten to close. Um, but credit reports, if there are some credit reports for the opposing party, that can provide some information. For example, there's a credit card that the mistress used that the wife never knew about. Um, of course, it's against federal law for your client to run a credit report on their spouse without their permission. So we're not at all suggesting that they run credit reports on their spouse. But if they happen to have them from another a refinancing or something else, um, you should ask to have them bring that in. Um, now we are able to go online to the Social Security Administration and print out our report of our Social Security benefits. This is the document you used to receive once a year in the mail, um, but now you and your, cli your client and, and his or her spouse can go online and download um, straight from the website their current Social Security statement. Sometimes this is very helpful if there's a dispute about income or um, you need, your client wants to have some idea of what they may expect um, on Social Security going forward. Um, but that's an informal discovery that is accessible. They should um, ask your client to get for you. Um, this is this is informal, and of course you can also subpoena this. But text messages. Um, I understand from a sonar that was just given to the American Academy that some uh, cell phone providers are now allowing content of text messages to be subpoenaed or produced. I have known for a while that um, you can ask for some content, depending on who your provider is, you can ask for text message content from your own cell phone, cell phone provider. Um, Sometimes you get some and sometimes you don't, but apparently there are some providers that now will give you some text message content um, upon request and pursuant to a subpoena. The downside you'll run into with a subpoena is that you will not have um, it going back for a really long time. My guess is it's going to be around 30 days. Um, I once subpoenaed a cell phone provider and got, uh, this was Sprint, this was probably in 2004, and I don't know that Sprint still does this, um, but we got text message content um, for two week period, and so I kept subpoenaing the cell phone provider every two weeks to get, keep current on the text messages, and the opposing counsel, I, I think, thought I was crazy, and because he never did anything to ask me about it or to stop it, I think he was under the assumption that I was not able to get text message content, and um, when I finally sent him the packet that I had received, I did it for three times before I sent him the information that I received, um, he didn't know that I was getting text messages that his, his client and her boyfriend, um, whom she lied about, were you know, communicating. Um, but you can now apparently sometimes get text message content uh, um, via subpoena. Um, I also in that case got some saved voicemails that they turned over to me. Um, and most interest, interest, interestingly, um, I was able to get cell phone tower tracking um, information. And I've spoken about this before in other seminars, but it was so exciting in our case because the opposing uh, party lied about having an affair with a gentleman that lived in New Jersey. She was a flight attendant and flew out of the New Jersey hub. That was her home base. Um, and my client absolutely did not believe she was having an affair with, let's call him Dr. Bob. Um, because of the cell phone tower tracking, we could see that our client was spending time um, within a three mile radius of a little town that had a hospital. We did know Dr. Bob existed, we did know what kind of doctor Dr. Bob was, and because of the um, configuration of the cell phones that were being used over a weekend period of time, we knew she was near a hospital. Um, and luckily for me and my client, um, Dr. Bob had originally been from another state where online we could get his driver's, uh, his um, auto tag license, his um, tag license. So we had the tag license, the state we knew he was from, we didn't know what kind of car, but we knew there was a hospital nearby and so we hired a private detective to go into the parking lot and look for this license plate from a different state with this number and our private detective found the car in a parking lot and followed him to a uh, look like a double wine to be honest, a little house 
um, where my client's wife was seen going in and out and when I showed my client the video from the from the private detective he was like oh my god that's the wreath from our we used to have that wreath on our front door and she had put the wreath from their front door onto um, her paramours and her door up in another state New Jersey um, and that was all because of cell phone tower tracking. It was a very valuable tool, um, and I don't think people use it as much as you, as, as you really can get a lot of good information. It would be a very valuable tool. It does take time to read the coordinates and to map it out on a calendar. That's what we did, and we used the, the cell phone coordinates as well as her ATM and debit charges, which if you'll pay, you know, on every financial statement shows exactly where you were when you were using your debit card or ATM card. So we, we literally could map out when she left Atlanta, minute by minute almost, where she was and, and what she was doing. Um, let me see. Uh, pharmacy records. Now this is something that your client may be able to get informally without discovery depending on um, you know the pharmacy and has she been the one picking up and dropping off certain um, prescriptions for her spouse sometimes pharmacists pharmacies will turn these over other times you do have to subpoena them I think the proper way is HIPAA through HIPAA is to subpoena them but we have um, gotten some very interesting prescriptions um, that our, my client was not aware of um, at pharmacies that their spouse was taking, um, for example, Viagra. Um, but don't forget about pharmacies if um, there's a denial of a sexual relationship outside the marriage. Um, another informal review, life insurance applications. Um, you have to um, make a representation about your income and approximate net value when applying for life insurance. Um, and sometimes the, a value of a, a closely held business might be pretty high on a life insurance application as well as the mortgage loan application I discussed a, a little while ago. This may not apply going forward as much, but the Easy Pass records also show a lot of interesting information. So people going up and down 400 who had no business going up and down 400, but for a girlfriend or boyfriend, um, if it goes back in time when we still had the toll roads and the records, and I have not. Um, the Easy Pass now that's on 85, where you pay to go in the HOV line lane, I imagine you can still get records of someone going up 85 if they're using that um, and they're saying they didn't go up there or something like that. Um, let's see my notes about some of my more informal discovery. We talked about spoliation. Um, now I'm going to talk briefly about discovery. Of course, we have our standard interrogatories and requests for production of documents. Um, I'll talk briefly about a few practice tips there. Um, we have our depositions, of course. Um, and I also want to share, you know, subpoena, subpoena ducas tecum, seeking documents from third parties, request to admit, and entry, request for entry upon land can also be valuable too, so I'll touch on. Um, okay. So interrogatories. Some of my practice tips on interrogatories include um, ask your client for some questions. Of course, you may not want to ask all the questions or you decide not to use them, but sometimes uh, clients can come up with something that you have not thought of that turn out to be very valuable in the case. Um, we like to have our clients review our interrogatories for a couple reasons. One, so they're apprised of the work that went into drafting them and the work that will be involved um, on their spouse's side and the work on the RN. So they aren't surprised about the fees associated with discovery. Two, also um, to see if there are any questions that when our client gets asked the same question could be a problem for him or her. Um, three, to make suggestions even if they haven't provided us some questions. Um, and, and depending on the size of the case, we may um, eliminate a lot of questions and not ask a typical standard interrogatories because of the means in the case um, and with some input from our client. Um, okay. Another little practice tip is you may want to save some interrogatories asked later in the case, um, depending on, on the, how the evidence develops. Um, so that's just a little side practice to us, I suppose. Request for production of documents. Um, that's probably the most valuable discovery tool that we have in family law. Um, 
until we get our hands on the documents and really are able to analyze either the marital estate, um, the assets liabilities, um, any dissipation of asset issue, um, conduct, um, of course custody related issues depending on allegations of drug or alcohol abuse or traveling, they say they are traveling, um, until we get the documents and spend the time going through them, um, we can't properly do our due diligence and really properly advise our clients. Um, so I think that's the most important discovery tool that we have in family law. But, well, excuse me, and, and not only is it important to think um, about the questions we want to ask and see if there's anything unusual that we may want to include given the facts in the case, but it's important to keep organized in terms of what you get back. Um, and our audience member is coughing right now, so excuse me. Um, but it's important to, you have an ethical obligation to, to make sure that you, what you ask for, you look at and you utilize and you organize and, and, um, and have someone look through it. It might be a paralegal in your office who does the primary review and educates you on some of the information, but um, don't just ask for documents and not do anything with them because that would be, in my opinion, malpractice, I think, um, depending on what are in those documents. Um, it used to be my practice to ask for the original documents and to actually go and touch the original documents. Um, I think we've all gotten into, now that we do so much electronically, not to look and touch the original documents. But don't forget about your right to the original documents. And if it's a calendar and you can't read it, or a check register and you can't read it, you can insist upon making having them make that original um, production to you so you can get the information you need from it. Requested on parties and um, subpoena ducas tecum. That also is a very valuable tool um, to employers, especially in a complicated um, employer benefits case with a lot of options, restricted stock, different plans. Um, um, to um, doctors in a case where there's um, custody issues. Um, are just conduct issues. I once subpoenaed a plastic surgeon. Um, this was a very, family had significant, significant assets and um, it was a contested custody case. My client's spouse had been at the Betty Ford Clinic um, but came back denying that she had a problem. And I really subpoenaed the plastic surgeon for two reasons. One, I knew my client's spouse was a very difficult person and I felt if someone was difficult with everybody, they would be very difficult with their plastic surgeon's office, and I was right. Um, I, literally, I served the discovery, and two days later, I had her whole file in my office. They didn't wait for objections. They didn't wait for HIPAA. They apparently were happy to turn this over to their spouse's, I mean, their client's um, spouse's divorce lawyer. And I got some before and after pictures I wish I had never gotten, but more importantly, there were, um, admissions by my client's spouse to drug and alcohol problems. She was honest with her plastic surgery and going plastic surgeon, excuse me, going under anesthesia about what she had done and when she was doing it. Um, that's something I would never, you know, I could never have gotten that information. Um, we did get the Betty Ford records and of course they supported the same theory, but um, those were important records to obtain. I'm trying to think of some other third parties. Um, Oh, um, you know, I think I think practitioners have sometimes gotten sloppy in advising their clients when they're served with the request for production of documents what they need to produce and, and make them, no, it's just not bank statements. It's the check register and it's deposit slips and it's, you know, it's a lot more than just the bank statements. And um, only until you serve a bank can you actually get detailed on wire detailed information about wire transfers and the accounts the transfers are going to and deposits and showing what actually got deposited um, so I say think depending on the case going on and getting everything you can get from a financial institution is often important um, and of course there's the discovery um, on the paramour that's always interesting Sometimes you get a lot of good stuff and sometimes you get the Fifth Amendment, but um, depending on the case, that can be very helpful to your client. 
requests for admissions are something that um, I think we should use more of. Um, my law partner Gwen Holland has used requests for admissions very successfully when her client's husband um, had a long-term girlfriend and we subpoenaed credit card statements from the credit card company and saw charges that clearly related to the girlfriend um, and we did request she and um, Eric Chambers in our office did request for admissions um, outlining and they were like 250 requests for admissions and opposing counsel actually filed a motion for protective order and this was um, decided by one of our Fulton County judges and I uh, might have been Judge Shoup um, ruled that no they were no it was Judge Lane they were legitimate requests for admissions even though there were a lot of them they were seeking information and they were brought for judicial economy reasons um, and having 200 answers to purchases for the girlfriend uh, I think we're very instrumental in helping my client very successfully resolve that case. But um, requests for admissions are a, real, a very useful tool to consolidate a lot of evidence um, and not take a lot of time, for example, in a deposition. Um, ask more valuable questions in a deposition rather than, you know, did you, per did you take your paramour to dinner at Bones, for example. Um, and then the request to um, Enter um, upon land, entry upon land. That is something that um, I've not used often, but in situations when the parties have been separated for quite some time and when there's a closely held business that your client has been kind of excluded from, there are times when you need to go inside and see um, what assets gather what information you can, um, having access to the other condominium, other house, or the apartment, or the business. In the last remaining few minutes of my time, I want to talk a little bit about some additional suggestions on substantive issues to ask for in discovery. Um, more and more, I think all of us are seeing trusts come up in our case, life insurance trust, um, education trust trust where one party or both parties put marital assets into a trust for a variety of reasons, some uh, maliciously and some not. And so um, it's very important that we start including in our standard request for production, I believe, to ask for our copies of all trust instruments, declarations of trust, for any trust, and, and you want to use the term where you, your, the opposing party, where you, your descendants, or your spouse are a grantor, settler, donor, trustee, or beneficiary, contingent or otherwise. Um, and my law partner, Gwen Holland, has a lot of experience in trust litigation. She's been very helpful in many of my cases where trusts have played a big role. And over time, we have kind of developed that language, and it should take care of um, any kind of trust um, that you may have in your case. And in addition to asking for the trust instrument and the declarations of trust, you want to ask for the trust tax returns using that same definition, a return for any trust where you, your spouse, your descendants, or grantor, settler, donor, trustee, or beneficiary contingent or otherwise. And finally, of course, you'll want to ask for any financial records related to the trust, bank account statements, brokerage statements, um, any documents evidencing the assets held in a trust along those lines. We ask a few questions in interrogatories, mainly uh, just trust referencing either you, your spouse, or your descendants as a grantor, settler, uh, current or future, or potential beneficiary, trustee. Um, and we also ask about having a power of appointment. Um, and you'll have to ask my law partner about the importance of that provision. But anyway, that's something that we've, we do believe is important to ask in many cases um, in today's time because we see so many trusts now in our work. And then finally, um, with the advent of the new child support guidelines in 2005, um, we need to remember to include on our interrogatories, for example, our request for production documents, some of the, some of the information which um, you're required to complete um, in our child support worksheets. For example, um, ask questions about if you're imputing any income, what is the basis for um, this imputed income? Um, if you're claiming any deviation, provide the documents which support the deviation. For example, you know, extraordinary educational expenses or extracurricular activities. Um, and ask for documentation supporting um, 
you know, the provisions and the worksheets that you have to fill out and, and, and make a factual finding to support. So I've enjoyed my time today with you sharing some information about discovery. I hope that some of what I've shared will be helpful to you in your practice. And if you have any questions or would like any forms, let me know and just email me, tina at hollandronberry.com, and I'm happy to email you back. Thank you.